I want to say good evening. It's good to be in Bible College again tonight. We thank the Lord for you being here. I uh, appreciate uh, those uh, students that are taking courses correspondence, uh, those in Stanford, Nebraska, uh, those in uh, Guyana, South America. And uh, Brother Ram is back at home with his family. He got there Saturday, so we thank the Lord for that. And I appreciate Brother Ram, so I'm going to say hello to him. Also, uh, students that we have uh, taken in correspondence, Brother Craig Shue, appreciate him. And then those uh, in other countries as well, uh, those in Ghana, West Africa as well. So we thank the Lord uh, for BBI. Tonight we, we are doing uh, our second part of our Bible History and Geography class. And we've been going through uh, just a review of the Old Testament classes, or uh, Old Testament books of the Bible, rather, in these classes. And uh, tonight we come to the book of 2 Samuel, uh, one of the great Old Testament books, the book of 2 Samuel. And if you could find that in your Bible, uh, as you turn there, uh, First and Second Samuel, and First Kings and Second Kings, uh, used to be known many, many years ago as the Book of Kings. So actually, uh, at one time, in some of the older uh, manuscripts, it's even thought that uh, that First and Second Samuel were just one book, the Book of Samuel. But then some of them named it uh, First Kings uh, and Second Kings, Third Kings, and Fourth Kings. But we have it named First and Second Samuel. So we come to Second Samuel tonight, and I thank God that they separated that. It makes it easier to find. Uh, the context of the verses is still the same. The name was just changed. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But we have uh, exactly, I believe, what God would have us to have in the book of Second Samuel. And boy, it's such a wonderful book. I would encourage you to read through it. But if you'll notice in chapter number 7, I want to read verse number 16. The Bible says, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Now, uh, one of the great verses in the Bible, you say, uh, is that a verse pertaining to David? Well, not physically, but in the spiritual sense, yes. But it refers to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Through the lineage of David came our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And He will one day reign uh, from the throne of Jerusalem and He will reign from His Father David's throne there. Right. Amen? And I'm thankful for that. So I love the book of 2 Samuel. I would encourage you uh, to, to make much study of the book of 1 and 2 Samuel. What great books they are. Really and truly, the theme of 2 Samuel, uh, if we could think of one theme that would be good for America, would be the term unification. Uh, the unification. Uh, the country of Israel was divided into Judah and Israel, uh, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, and uh, they, they needed uh, uh, unity. They needed unity, amen? Not, uh, and, and as I think of that, America needs un unity, amen, amen, tonight. And we do. And uh, America is a divided nation, and I don't think this election is going to settle that, amen? No. Probably make it worse, just to be honest with you. As we think about uh, this book of 2 Samuel, uh, I love it again. It's a great book. The events of this book, uh, some say uh, year 1105 to 971 B.C. Uh, is the events, the timeline of events. The author of the book of 2 Samuel, uh, many believe Samuel wrote a lot of 1 Samuel, but I'll dare go out on a limb and tell you, Probably Samuel didn't write it, especially after his death, amen. Uh, he probably didn't. So it's untelling who exactly wrote this book or finished it, but we know the Holy Ghost is the author. And uh, the setting of the book of 2 Samuel it would be the, the thought of the united kingdom of Israel. And by the way, uh, Israel is God's chosen people. He's got His hand on them even now. Amen. We can be thankful for that. But 2 Samuel actually just picks up where 1 Samuel leaves off. Saul is now dead. And we read the tragic story of Saul's life. For 35 years, 
of the 40 years of his reign. I think that he lived the life of a, of a maniac. He had bouts of mental lapse, I think. I think the devil tormented him, jealousy and rage throughout his, his reign as king. And now Saul is dead and also his three sons. And we know that Jonathan was one of those three sons. So uh, now Saul and Jonathan are gone. They're dead. And so the people of Judah, they chose David and they declared David to be king of Israel. And while the northern tribes, actually, uh, they chose Saul's youngest son, Ishbosheth. And uh, it's an interesting thought as we read about this. David ruled in Hebron for seven and one half years. Seven and a half years. And then later, Israel uh, finally acknowledges David as their king. And David reigns in Jerusalem 33 more years. So David reigned over 40 years as king and 33 over all of Israel and seven uh, something, seven and a, maybe a half year over Judah. Second Samuel really reviews the life, the key events in David's life of uh, those 40 years reigning. And like First Samuel, uh, this book can be divided in several different parts and uh, actually we're going to look at three main parts and then chapter 11 uh, marks the turning point in the life and success of David. And you need to read this book. You really need to read the book of 2 Samuel. All right, we're gonna, I'm going to give you what I call a skeleton, okay, tonight. A very skinny skeleton. A skeleton don't have a lot on it, amen, but bones. But I'm going to give you a skeleton tonight. Write down this, the success of David. The success of David. And you could write chapters 1 through chapter number 10. Under David's leadership, the northern and the southern tribes of Israel are united. David's success was great, both militarily and domestically. David had great success. And in fact, I could say one word about it. It was remarkable. Isn't it amazing what God can do, amen, through a man that's just willing to be used? And uh, God used David in a mighty way. Under, under the leadership of King David, the nation actually shifted from tribal independence to a more centralized government. And uh, David captured the city of Jerusalem. And he made it the capital. And he made it his city. So David was a man after what? God. Well, we need some of them today, don't we? I think a man after God's own heart makes a great pastor, don't you? I think a man after God's own heart makes a great husband and a great father. Right. Amen. But the, the problem is today, uh, there are a few men that are after God's own heart. Amen. And we need some men today that would be that way. But David was a man after God's own heart. And one of the things that I love about David is the mercy that he showed to Saul's family. Right. If you've never read the story or heard it preached, oh, it's, it's a wonderful story. Uh, in chapter 1, uh, David learns and mourns about Saul's death. Could you imagine doing that? After you'd been chased around and tried to be killed, and Saul was wanting to kill David, and, and he chased him around everywhere. Could you imagine David uh, thinking and respecting King Saul enough to mourn his death? David's a man after God's own heart. In uh, chapter 2, David was made again king over Judah. And then in chapter 3, it lists uh, the sons that were born in Hebron. And then Abner deserts to David from Saul. And then it has a record of his death. And then Ishbosheth's murder in chapter 4, it's recorded. And then in chapter 5, we see David is, is anointed and, and, and actually uh, given the throne of, of all of Israel. And then in chapter 6, we find David brings the ark to Jerusalem. He did some fantastic things. I love the study of David. And David did these great things. He brought uh, fairness into that when he, when he showed kindness to Saul's family. In chapter 7, uh, David desires to build the temple and God <clears throat> gave him reassurance of the covenant. And boy, isn't it good to know that God keeps His word. I'm glad to thank God for that. Amen. God responded as, as David brought the covenant 
uh, and had that desire, God responded by actually reaffirming uh, the covenant that he originally made with Abraham. And he gives David assurance, amen, uh, of, of, of that. And I'm thankful that he says that uh, one of David's descendants would always reign on the throne. The covenant is realized in David's distant son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if I could say anything about chapters 1 through chapter 10, I would say we see the success of David. My favorite story is the story of Mephibosheth. I love that. I love to read it. I love to preach it. There is so much in that. Uh, how that he sent the servant Ziba uh, to Lodibar, to the house down there, uh, the house of no bread. And he sent him down there to fetch that one that was lame from, uh, from the fall. And uh, boy, it's just yeah, a man. wonderful story. I'd love to preach that tonight and just shout it out. Amen. But I'm not going to because we're giving you a skinny, a skinny skeleton outline tonight. But we see the success of David. But tonight, uh, it's amazing. And, and a lot of people, uh, they, they, uh, uh, the Bible is, is just a plain book. And I say that with due respect to the Word of God. In other words, the Bible is not a shiny book. It's not, it's not, it, it's not a book. Now what I'm trying to listen carefully, the Bible is a plain book in the sense that the Bible reveals man for what he is. Amen. The Bible is not a, a glossy, shiny, glimmery kind of politician type. Want you always to see the good of everything. Because the Bible reveals men for what they are. That's right. And it does. Right. And in chapter 11, I want to be honest with you, uh, God could have skipped that and we would have, would have had no knowledge of all of that. Mm -hmm. But God included it to help you and I to see right. that even a man after God's own heart can mess up. Right. None of us are immune from making huge mistakes. So we see the success of David in chapters 1 through 10, but then I see in chapter number 11 the sin of David. And there's the second point in your skinny outline. David knows that the Lord is responsible for his success. And anybody that is successful in God's work knows where that success comes from. Yep. And if you think it's you, you are dumb as a box of rocks. Can I tell you tonight, there's a man in this very room that could come and testify of all of what has happened in his ministry. He would get up and he could say, well, you know, I started out a very poor Indian boy. Didn't have anything. I had very, very few things. Had a pair of short uh, pants. And uh, not, not short, short pants, but short pants and, and just a shirt. Am I right? And a, and a bicycle that had one pedal. Mm -hmm. And that's how he started his ministry out. But if you were to go over there and look at it today and see what God has done and all the, but just the physical things, the buildings and the children, nearly 300, maybe over 300 children by now. 297 children, the last count I had. And is that right? 297. 297. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on him pretty close. I know it down to the number. But it's amazing. Four different locations of children's homes. Wow. And they're reaching Bible college and a new uh, 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 dining hall that's just, just magnificent. And, and I see the, the, the dormitories that the children live in. And, and the church buildings has been constructed. And all these great things. And the crusade meetings has been put on. And, and, if, and if, if, if we were to look at the man, we could say, wow, God. I mean, God has, has blessed him. And but but this man has must he must have some great ability. I want to tell you, if 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 we were to ask Brother Obed to come up here, I want to tell you who he would tell us that his source of success was all in Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, he had no ability on his own. He doesn't have the intelligence. I don't have the intelligence, and none of us do. If you're going to be successful. Surrender yourself and be pliable and let God use you and just be willing to be used whatever God wants to do with Amen. your life and you'll be amazed 
and you will be successful if you're pliable and willing to serve the Lord and do what He'd have you to do. Right. Now, you may not have the ministry that Brother Obed Missal has. You may not have four children's home. You may not have the responsibility of all the IGM family and all those missionaries that are sent out. You may not have the responsibility of feeding 297 children every day, not, not just a couple of days a year, but every day. You may not have that responsibility, but I want to tell you, you can be successful, not maybe in the same magnitude, but you can be successful in that which God would have you to do if you just make yourself available. Mm -hmm. But I warn you tonight, as someone should and probably did warn David, can I tell you maybe at the peak and the height of David's influence, all of these things got perhaps to him and he became a little bit, maybe just a little bit prideful, maybe just a little bit lazy. And I want to tell you, it's easy to do when you get right. to that that fulcrum, you think, man, I've arrived, and maybe he thought that, I don't know, but at the peak of his influence, David abandoned his principles, and he committed adultery with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. And it was a great error in his part. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you tonight that men can make mistakes, mm -hmm. listen to me carefully, that will follow them to the grave and beyond. Because David's sin with Bathsheba was just not the action and the act of adultery and the pregnancy and the murder, but it has haunted him and it still haunts him to this very day. Every time the record is read, it reminds us that men can make mistakes and that record follows them on. Even though David accomplished many great things, he was a man after God's own heart. I want to warn you, that at the height of success, there's a possibility of a greater temptation to sin. Right. I know a preacher. Brother Tony knows him by name as well. And we, we've heard him preach before. We, we sat under his preaching a few times. And he is in prison today for the very same sin in an even greater degree of what, of what David did with Bathsheba. Maybe not murder, but this man did a terrible thing and he's in time, he's in prison tonight because of it. Mm -hmm. But David, as Bathsheba informed him that she is expecting child, David tries to cover up his sin in the process. <coughs> he engineers a plan and he puts uh, Uriah on the front line and, and Uriah was one of David's most faithful soldiers and and, and Uriah died and then after a period of mourning, David, he tried to cover it all up and he, he brought her into his family and he married her and she gave birth to that little boy. And that baby was innocent, by the way. And needless to, to, to say, it displeased God greatly. Right. And from this point on, David would experience continual struggles and uh, both within his family and within the nation. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you, sin has a great cost. Right. A pastor that will sin has a, 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 an effect upon his congregation. Right. He might hide it, but there's still an effect because God knows about it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. A lay person, a deacon, a preacher in a congregation of people, I don't care who you are, you say, well, it, it's only me that I, it's affect. Let me tell you something. Sin has a way of affecting us all. Man. And it does. And it not only just affects you, but it affects those around you as well as your family and the church family as well. So we see David's great error, the sin of David. Now let me give you the third uh, on, the, on the skeleton, the skinny skeleton outline tonight. Not only the success of David, and the sin of David. But in chapters 12 through chapter 20, as a result of David's sin, and because of that, and by the way, you can get forgiveness of sin, but sin still has consequences. Right. And those consequences will follow you like a hound dog, brother, after a bone. I'm telling you, you can get them clean, you can get them forgiven, you can get them under the blood, but I'm telling you tonight, if you dibble and dabble right. in sin, right. and you go out in sin, and you go away from God, I'm telling you, there can be consequences that will haunt you to the day you're buried. Amen. And it can happen. 
We see the struggles of David in chapter 12 through chapter 20. God confronts David about his sin. It's interesting what happened with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. You know what he did? God sent Nathan the prophet down. And by the way, we know that that uh, that little baby that little baby died. We know that story very well. How sad! How sad that is that that child had to pay the price because of the sin of his father. But God didn't. He wasn't satisfied. God said, "Sent Nathan down. Nathan the prophet. He goes down." And uh, he visits, visits David. And he, by the way, uh, think about this. Now I realize that Nathan, who he was, and he was a very bold man, but nevertheless, David was the king. Mm -hmm. David was the authority of Israel. Whatever King David said would happen. And Nathan, the prophet, went with a message and he told the story about a man who had uh, only had one little lamb and that lamb was taken away by a man who had plenty of lambs. And that lamb was wrongfully taken. And that lamb was wrongfully killed. And uh, David stood up and he righteously condemned that man's actions. And with a bony finger, I can see that old prophet of God take his hand and say to David, Thou heart the man. Point it right out to him. David at last confesses his sin. Right. But again, the consequence of his sin is far-reaching and very tragic. Mm -hmm. And that son dies, and, and then not only that, but in his family. If you read the story of those chapters, David struggles with his family. Amnon commits incest with his half-sister Tamar. Sad story. Absalom, Tamar's brother, kills Amnon and flees for his life. And then later, Absalom is allowed to return. And then, what does he do? He schemes to take the, the kingdom from his father. What a, what a sad, sad outcome. A twisted family. Can I tell you, you can go back and the result of it all is found in chapter 11. If David had not committed that sin... All of these things I don't believe would have been added to him. I don't think it would have. The civil war, if you would, continues as a man named Sheba marshals the allegiance of the northern tribe, but he too is killed and, and a further strife is averted. I want to tell you, as we look at that chapters and those chapters 12 through 20, and we see all of these things and all the mess and all the... the, the, the uh, the just the family turmoil that was in day. Could you imagine how it grieved him? Even up to his dying days, he grieved him. Absalom, Absalom. I can hear David. I can hear him calling out, Absalom, my son, Absalom. David loved his son Absalom. And there he was. He too died. And then we come, not only that, the success of David, the sin of David, the struggles of David's life. But we come to the conclusion of this chapter. And then we just simply see the summation of David. Now, these chapters in verses, chapters 21 through 24, they describe a lot of David's words and his deeds. They show us how moral and spiritual condition of the king here of David affects his physical and his spiritual state, but not only his self, but it also has an effect upon the nation. Sad that it is, the nation of Israel enjoyed God's <laughs> blessings when David was obedient. But now they suffer hardship because of David's disobedience. <clears throat> now, in spite of all of David's shortcomings, and I'm thankful, Psalms 51, you should read that sometime. Because David, scholars tell us for a year and a half, he dealt with that conviction and in Psalms 51, let's turn over there for just a moment. You don't mind, do you? We're about done. Psalms 51. David was a broken man. And he said this in Psalms 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitudes of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. 
Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin my mother did conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit. Did you all hear that? From me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Can I tell you tonight that David got to the place, yep. that man after God's own heart, that he knew what he had to do. Mm -hmm. And he ran back to God. And I want to tell you, no matter when we sin mm -hmm. and we mess up, we need to run back to the Lord. Right. We need to wait a year and a half. And we sin every day. And we do. And we might as well be honest about right. it. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need not to dwell in it. We need to keep on in it. We need to try to hide it. But we need to confess it. And say, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I want to have joy, don't you? We learned so many lessons from the book of 2 Samuel. I thank God for it. David was God's man. And he had a responsive and faithful attitude toward God, and God used him in a mighty way. Tonight, I want us to think about the success of David, but then the sin of David, mm -hmm. the struggles of David as a result of sin, and then the summation of David's life. And we can apply that to ours. I think we can learn some life lessons from 2 Samuel. It will help us tonight. I told you I was going to be short tonight, and I believe that's what the Lord would have us to say. And uh, this lesson is a very short lesson, but I think it's a very great lesson. Let me just say it this way. Blessings come to you and those around you when you are obedient to God's commands. When we mind the Lord, we stay after Him, and we have a heart that's right towards God. I challenge you tonight. Confess your sins. Stay close to God. Walk close to Him. May the Lord bless you is our prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You, Lord, for tonight. Lord, this good group of students. Lord, we love them. Thank You for 2 Samuel. Lord, what a great book it is. And Lord, again, Lord, You could have omitted chapter 11. Lord, You could have left that out. And Lord, we would have never known about David's terrible, terrible sin. But Lord, You put it in there for a purpose. Father, to help us to realize even a man after God's own heart can make tragic mistakes. Lord, help us to learn from His example. Lord, that we would follow after You and Lord, we would resist temptation. Lord, we'd be strong and we'd stay close to You and Lord, when You bless us with success, and Lord, that comes in many different things, in many different ways. And Lord, it may not be successful in man's eyes because, Lord, I believe that a person that is in the center of Your will, Lord, wherever they are, if they are giving the gospel, Lord, even if they're being rejected, and facing persecution because of it, and Lord, if You've placed them there, Lord, I believe that they're successful in doing that which You bid. Father, tonight, Lord, I pray that in the midst of any success that You might give us, Father, tonight that we would be attentive, Lord, to realize that the tempter may come by at that moment. At the time when we think that we've arrived and, and Lord, that we're doing such a great work, Lord, we need to be careful and we need to be on guard. Father, I pray that when we do fail You, and Lord, we do often, that we would repent quickly. And Lord, we'd not wait 
like David did. And Lord, but we run to you right at that moment and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, help us to learn and glean. Help us to see David. Lord, as he was kind to the family of Saul, especially to Mephibosheth. Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would be that kind of person as well. We'd be sensitive and, and we'd seek out, Lord, those that we could help, even our enemies. Lord, I pray for our nation tonight. Lord, I pray for the vote tonight. And Lord, right now, we don't know how it will turn out, but You do. And Lord, You give us a choice, just as You've given people a choice of salvation. And Lord, You give this country a choice. And Father, tonight, we trust You for the outcome because, Lord, no matter who's president and in the White House, no matter who's in the governor's mansion in Raleigh, You are still God. Yes. And Lord, You're seated upon the throne. Lord, I pray that You give us wisdom and boldness, Lord, to stand in these evil days. And Lord, having done all, to stand. And we ask it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.